Let's go to the Lord once more in prayer. Father, as we come now again tonight to your word, we do so not just because it's our routine or habit, but because we truly need to hear from you. So we pray, Father, that you would soften our hearts and open our ears, that you would minister to your, your word to us, your people, through the preaching of your word, that you would help us to see who we are to be as your bride and help us especially to see our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might grow in our love and affection for him tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are continuing in our evening series tonight on the church, the communion of the saints. We actually just sung through a number of images that we've uh, spent the last several weeks walking through. We've looked at the church as the body of Christ, as a chosen people, as the wisdom of God, and, and last week as a pillar and a buttress of truth, the household of God. And tonight, we are turning to Revelation 19. We'll be looking there at the church as the bride of Christ. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, if you have it, Revelation chapter 19, specifically verses 6 through 9. Now, as you're doing that, let me just say that I truly hope that this text, as we look at it tonight, will be for you a timely encouragement as the church, as it has been to me over the last couple of weeks as I've been uh, thinking and, and just pondering the implications of this incredible reality that as the church, we are the bride of Christ. In fact, as I was thinking about this particular picture that God has given us of his church and, and this particular passage, I couldn't help but think back to the beginning of the pandemic and John Krasinski's little self-published news show. It was called Some Good News. Uh, do you, some of you remember Some Good News? I see some nods. Krasinski, of course, much better known for his role as Jim in the office. But at the beginning of the pandemic, with so much hard and heavy news all around to digest, he created his own little news show for publishing on YouTube. It was called, quote, a, a new show dedicated entirely to good news. And it provided some welcome and timely uh, moments of encouragement in a really, really hard time. And perhaps as we think about the church and what perhaps can sometimes feel like a steady flow of disheartening news, podcasts and Twitter posts, public failures, deconversion stories, tragic reports, discouraging arguments within the church. I wonder if there are not those of us here tonight who don't feel like you could use some good news, not just about the world at large, but even perhaps about the church in particular. And that's what our passage is for us tonight. It's some good news about the church, or to put it another way, it's some good news about us as the church, as the bride of Christ. And it's good news that comes as we draw back, if you will, or as Blair said this morning, as we kind of zoom out for a moment and then zoom ahead in our view to get, get a big picture and to see a long range view of who the church is as the bride of Christ in a vision that's given to us here through John. And in that drawing back, we'll be reminded tonight first that the bride of Christ is, first of all, a bride redeemed. She's a bride redeemed. Also that she's a bride made ready. And that in Christ she'll be a rewarded bride. And all of this because she is a relished bride. So a redeemed, a readied, a rewarded, a relished bride. That's the good news we'll see about the church with John tonight. And I hope it'll be an encouragement to us all. So let's give attention then to God's word from Revelation Chapter 19, beginning in verse six. 
Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So jumping in here then to this revelation from John, again, we've kind of stumbled upon a vision of the future and we find ourselves at a wedding. It's the wedding of the lamb and his bride. And not unlike many of our weddings today, this wedding opens with a song. And that can be a powerful moment, can it? You've been to weddings, I'm sure, and you know that moment the prelude begins and there's the, the seating of the family, of course, and then the doors open and, and the groom comes out, usually with the pastor and the groomsmen come along with him and they take their places up front. Then, of course, the doors open again in the back and the bridesmaids make their way down. And then as everyone gets set and ready, those doors close. And then there's this, this pause, a turn, a wait for a new song to begin a song change. The bridal procession is about to begin. And isn't that such a poignant moment of expectation? You know, when all the people turn to look back down the aisle at the doors, just waiting for that moment when they'll fling open and the bride will be revealed. I was thinking back to uh, some weddings that I've been a part of. I've been able to be a part of a few weddings at this point now as a pastor, but Actually, I was thinking about the prelude, the processional moment, and, 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 and one wedding that actually was before I was a pastor came to mind. I was there as a groomsman. And of course, we had that moment. The, the prelude was drawing to a close. We were all set up front, ready to go. And, and there was that pause, that moment, that waiting, that looking for those doors to fling open, and a silence that was broken by Highland Cathedral. Highland Cathedral bursts in, not over the speaker's, but from a live bagpiper playing in the back of the church. I don't know how many of you are aware or familiar with the tune, Highland Cathedral. I'm not gonna pull a Kevin and hum it for you tonight. Um, if you know it, you know it. And I guess if you don't know it, you don't know it. But if you don't know it, I would recommend you Google it later. It's a glorious, beautiful song. And it can't be done any better than on live bagpipes. And it was so powerful in that moment, as the doors opened, the bagpipes burst forth into Highland Cathedral. It was a glorious moment. And yet here we have in front of us a bridal processional, so much more powerful even than that. Then I heard what seemed to be a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Alleluia. It's a song, it's a celebration, an unrestrainable rejoicing, a crying out, Alleluia, or praise God. It's actually one of only four times this word Alleluia is used in the New Testament. It's an unbelievable moment. Incidentally, the other three actually come in the first five verses of chapter 19. There, the heavenly courts are rejoicing over God's judgment and destruction of his enemies. But here the rejoicing is centered on the arrival of a marriage, specifically the marriage of the Lamb. It's the marriage of the lamb, which juxtaposed to the bride in the next line makes it very clear that this, of course, is the groom. And the reference here, of course, is to Christ. If we turn just a couple of chapters over, you can do that to chapter 21. Won't take you long. Verse nine, we see him, Christ, pictured in the same way. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come and I will show you the bride, the wife, of the lamb. We might wonder here why of all the ways that Christ as the bridegroom could be spoken of here, of all the various names and titles attributed to him in other places, of all that could have been used, why here the lamb? Why is the lamb the name chosen for the wedding invitations? And it's a reminder, isn't it? 
right here in the wedding itself that this bride is a redeemed bride. And of the sacrifice necessary for that redemption, that Christ, as the Lamb of God, died for his bride, that he was slain as a willing sacrifice for her, the perfect and complete and final sacrifice to take away her sins, his life for hers, in order that he might rescue her from death, in order that he might make her clean, in order that he might make her pure, in order that he might bring her to himself. It's the same truth that comes through in Ephesians chapter five, another passage well known in connection with marriages, husbands and wives, but also Paul speaking of Christ and his marriage to the church, verses 25 through 27. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And so the first thing we see about the bride of Christ tonight is that she is a redeemed bride. The wedding, this marriage supper of the lamb, will happen because the death of the lamb happened first. He redeemed his bride with his very life. But he did it not because she was radiant to begin with. He did it not because she was already becoming, because she was already beautiful, because she stood out from the crowd. No, she was redeemed not because of her radiance, but for it, in order that she should become it. And friends, this is such good news. This is such comforting news for us tonight as the bride of Christ because it means that Jesus has already seen us and he's already loved us at our very worst. We don't have to fear discovery by him or rejection because there are no surprises for our groom. He knows every sin of his bride because he died for them. He paid for them with his life and he did so willingly in his love, his willing love for his bride. The bride of Christ is a bride redeemed. But the vision goes on as we move on and turn our attention from the bridegroom to the bride. Look again then at verse seven, where we see not only that the bride has been redeemed by her groom, but that she has also been readied for him. His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The redeemed bride has become the ready bride, clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. And notice first that this readiness, it's a granted Readiness. You see that literally stated here in verse 8, that it was something that was granted to her. The verb there is passive. It's not something that she did for herself. This is something that was done for her. It was given to her. It's grace. As it says in the scripture we read earlier in our service, Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Or again, if we were to return to that image of the lamb in Revelation, specifically Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, it says of The loved ones of Christ, these are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. He is the pure lamb of God without spot or blemish and his bride has been washed clean by his blood and been dressed in him in nothing less than his very own righteousness. She is justified and in him she literally is as clean as he is, as spotless as as he is, without blemish, as he is. We could say ready. 
And yet the text says more. The text also says that the bride has made herself ready and that this fine linen with which she has done so is the righteous deeds of the saints. There is a sense here then too that this readiness is also something that has grown over time. That the work of God in the church, in the lives of believers, it doesn't end with justification. It makes itself seen in spirit-generated transformation that results in our lives and the righteous deeds that come from that as we learn as Christians to live together by faith. Listen to how James Hamilton puts it. Not only have the stains of misdeeds been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, Righteous deeds make the fine linen shine. If you are trusting in him, then he is coming for you. So how do we make ourselves ready as verse seven describes? The answer is given in verse eight, with spirit wrought righteous deeds through faith. The passage is here so that by the Spirit in faith, we will walk in righteous deeds that will shine like white linen on that day. Friends, there's no doubt that for you as much as for me and for the church at large, there's much that we do today that is less than attractive. We must own that too. Even as we look to Jesus Christ for the cleansing and the forgiveness of our sins, it's why we have in our services week after week, morning and evening, time for confession. Of sins, And hopefully that's not the only time for us. It's simply true that there is much in the church today that is not beautiful. Sin that needs to be addressed. Much readying still to be done. There is, there's no sense and no good in denying that. In fact, one implication of these verses to us tonight is, is a call, it's a reminder that as the bride of Christ, we cannot be content with sin in our lives. We must be actively seeking to ready ourselves. And that's, of course, isn't that what a bride would want to do anyway? Wouldn't she want to ready herself for the groom she so desperately loves? So we must be striving by faith and with the help of the Spirit in the empowering grace of God to put off, to put off the old and to put on the new ourselves and with each other together as a church. But here's the beautiful reality that this text is showing us tonight. And it is so vital for us to remember is that as we do so, our sanctification, our growth in holiness and the righteous deeds that that grow out of that by faith, they don't go unnoticed. They will not be forgotten. They may not be seen, they may not be appreciated today. They may not be received. They may be even mocked or despised today, but one day, one day, they will be revealed. They will be seen for what they really are, for God-honoring, spirit-empowered, glowing, shining deeds of faith that are beautiful and treasured in the sight of God. Listen, people of God, you are the bride of Christ. And when by faith you turn yourself away from sinful indulgence and you look to find your joy, your satisfaction, your treasure in Jesus Christ, when by faith you give of your income until it actually cost you something so that somebody else might hear about Jesus Christ or that a burden might be lifted from your brother or your sister's life. When you refuse by faith vengeance as a response, choosing rather to leave it unto the Lord, when we get down on our knees again and we pray, oh God, would your kingdom come? Would your will be done? Would your name be hallowed? When you pick up a pen and a piece of paper and by faith, you let somebody know, I am thinking about you. I'm praying for you in Jesus' name. When you fight by faith not to give in to anxious worry, but to give a grave concern over to Jesus, to leave it with him, and even to, in that moment, give him thanks. When you take a risk to share Jesus with someone, when you work hard at your job as unto Christ, even if no one else knows why, when you do your work honestly, 
Even, even when it costs you something, when no one else but Jesus might notice or care. Kids, listen to me, kids. When you take a stand in your school or in your group of neighborhood friends for truth and righteousness, for Jesus' sake, what we're seeing tonight is that these deeds of the saints are being woven by God into a bridal gown that will sparkle when the wedding day comes. The bride is being made ready. And of course, while all this happens on a personal level, individually in the life of every person who trusts in Jesus, note one more thing here as well, that this vision is not of brides, plural. It's of a bride in the singular because there's a corporate aspect to the readiness of the bride. The church will not be ready merely as a collection of individuals, but as a corporate body. That is, as, as part of the, the church, my readiness is linked to yours, and yours is linked to mine, and to those who came before us, and to those who will come along after us, should Jesus tarry. In our church, to other churches around our city and around our world, there is one bride and one dress made up of the righteous deeds of a multitude of saints down through the centuries, across the world, and even across this room tonight. You, all, all of you, all of, of us who are trusting in Christ tonight are the bride of Christ. And when the wedding day comes, what remarkable grace, the bride will be ready. Clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that shimmers with the righteous deeds of saints accumulated down through the ages, and it will be an altogether glorious sight. And it's all by God's grace, all by God's grace, God's work of grace from beginning to end and preparing a bride for his son. We see that, of course, again, in that her readiness in, in every way that we've discussed is something ultimately that has been granted to her, given freely, not earned, it's grace alone. We see it also, though, in the song that we looked at earlier, the song that's being sung. Again, verse 7, look there at who gets the glory. You know where it comes from because you know who gets the glory, who gets all the glory. Let us rejoice and exult and give him, the Lord our God, the Almighty, him and him alone, the glory. Because if it's all of him, the Lord gets all the glory, all of it, for a rescued bride and for a readied bride. She's a bride rescued and a bride made ready. But she has not gotten ready for nothing. She's also a rewarded bride. Again, verse seven, for the marriage of the lamb has come. Some commentators have observed differences between uh, first century Jewish wedding customs and those of our our own moment in John's day, a betrothal was more legally binding form of engagement, something akin to being married legally now, husband and wife, yet still separated, not yet dwelling together, not engaging in marital intimacy yet until the wedding comes along, at which point there would be some kind of procession uh, in which the, the, the bridegroom, having taken measures to prepare things to receive his bride, would make his way. And the bride, having readied herself, would then be presented to him. And then the, mar the marriage supper, the wedding feast, this lavish party would commence, usually lasting days. Of course, the vision here in John doesn't go into all these specifics, so we don't want to press that too far. But perhaps it paints a helpful backdrop to what we're hearing. We are, we are truly, as the church, the bride of Christ now. As the church, if you are in Christ, he is your husband now. Again, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, he is now our head as our husband, and we submit to him. He is now actively loving us, nourishing us, and cherishing us as his own body because we are his bride. And yet, the wedding of the lamb is something still to come. And the beautiful promise here to us tonight is that it indeed will come one day. Our waiting will be over, and the marriage supper of the Lamb will come. And this faithful bride will be rewarded 
for her waiting. But what is it that is her reward? A wedding feast? Uh, Sure, of course, she's not gonna be left out of the the wedding feast. And, And let me just mention that that is no small thing because at our wedding, my wife, Rachel, and I, we, we got so busy talking to guests that we actually neglected to eat at our wedding. Uh, it didn't occur to us until we were kind of getting in the car to leave our wedding, and all of a sudden, we were really hungry. And so we asked somebody, hey, would you run in and maybe just kind of, you know, pull together some of the food from the reception and, and put in a to-go box for us. Apparently it had occurred to no one else either to be readying a to-go box and that we had some really hungry guests at our wedding because when they came back, it was a rather meager collection. (laughs) A Couple of fried mushrooms. I think there was maybe some of those cheese cubes and some crackers. Might've been a chicken kebab in there. I'm not sure. (laughs) We went from kind of an all you can eat kind of situation to is this all we can eat kind of? situation. It was hardly a wedding feast for two. So you know what we did? We ended up ordering pizza on our wedding night. Matter of fact, we had some friends drop it by. But we were grateful. And I should note that I actually love pizza. So I wasn't too unhappy. I, I, I really enjoy pizza. But, but here's what really mattered that, here's what really mattered in that moment, that I was with my bride. The pizza, it was pretty good pizza. But it was delightful because I was sharing it with her. And you know, access to all the food from the reception, to a king's feast, in fact, without her at that moment, it would have been worthless to me. So there's a wedding feast here, yes, and a lavish party, indeed. There's a palatial dwelling she's going to inhabit that literally is in paradise. Yes, all of that. But as a bride waiting for her groom, if she got all of that, but there was no groom, it'd be no reward at all. At the center of it all, the right and true reward of marriage for a bride is her groom. It's him, it's to be with him, to dwell with him, to be close to him, to share everything with him, to be one with him. And so it is with the bride of Christ, that when the last of the saints has been brought in, when the last of those righteous deeds has been done, when the bride is ready, it's promised here in this vision, the wedding will come, the wait will be over, The bridegroom will be here. The one who gave everything for her, the one whom her heart has come to adore, Christ, he is the reward for the waiting bride. And so beloved, it's a question for us tonight then. Is this the reward you're longing for? Friends in Christ, we are the bride of Christ. As such, how can our longing be for anything other than, anything outside of, anything at all without him. Do you long to be with Christ? Are you longing for the wedding day to come? It's it's a vital question for us, an important one for us to consider. But here's another one. Bride of Christ, do you know that he is? Do you know that he does, that he longs for that day? Because the bride of Christ is not only rewarded with him, she is also a reward, the reward for him. The text doesn't say this explicitly, but listen to the implicit testimony. Would there be a hallelujah chorus ringing out? Would there be thunderous calls for exaltation? Would there be unrestrainable rejoicing at the arrival of the wedding if the arrival of the bride was met by the lamb, by the groom, with a yawn. Can you imagine the guests at the wedding clapping and whistling and cheering and crying tears of joy as the bride and groom recess down the aisle if the groom has no smile on his face? 
or if his eyes weren't fastened with desire and delight upon his bride, no one would want to erupt in cheers for a bored bridegroom or for a groom who seems so clearly to be settling for his bride. Friends, this remarkable scene reminds us, it shows us, it reveals to us the heart of Christ for his church, for us, for you. Listen to Joel Beakey. The bridegroom is also eager for the wedding. In his great love, Jesus will beautify believers here because he's looking forward to seeing them as his beautiful bride one day. Jesus is the king of heaven, and we will be beautiful in his sight. The king of kings rules over the whole universe, and he will make us the queen of heaven. The angels will be our servants, and the king will take us into his garden. He will take us by the hand and lead us to paradise forever. Are you longing for that day? Do you know that he is? He is because he cherishes his bride, because he relishes her. And that's the last thing we need to see before we close, is that the bride, this bride, she's redeemed, she's ready, she's rewarded because she's relished. We can't come away from these verses tonight and imagine that there is anything less than true desire and true delight by the lamb in his bride. Isn't that part of what God is revealing to us by choosing to Tell it in this way. Christ is not bored with his church. He is not tired of her. He's not distracted. He does not have wandering eyes. He's not annoyed with her. He's not put off by her. Christ is not embarrassed by his bride. No, when that wedding day comes, there'll be no, oh, I guess she'll do from Jesus. Jesus is not holding his nose at the altar. If you are the bride of Christ, then you are the delight of Christ. You are the desire of Christ. And on that day when the marriage supper comes, that won't appear strange at all. There'll be no one saying, how could he desire her? No one will wonder, is this groom really happy with his bride? There'll be no reason to because of what he has done, because of who she is in him and what she has become in him. The church will be altogether beautiful and all of heaven is going to sing it to see it and to sing it. What an unspeakable privilege to be part of this bride. And what an important reminder that those sitting here with us, trusting in Christ, are too. You know, next week we're transitioning from looking at these kind of metaphors, these pictures, these images of the church to considering some more practical exhortations about how we ought to live together as the church. Derek will be preaching, as I said earlier, about bearing one another's burdens. So as we close, I want you to listen to just some words from Brian Habig and Les Newsom as they take and apply this vision of this wedding and these adoring eyes of Christ for his bride, the church, in our future as the church and our life together now, here's what they say. The point is this. When we begin in our hearts to look down the aisle of our own salvation and we see Christ standing there with anticipation, knees buckling under the weight of the beauty that he has created and sustained with tears flowing at the thought of the delight that he takes in us, only then will we begin corporately to be the church that God designed for his son. Only then will we find the courage to sacrifice for our churches in the way in which we're called to sacrifice, only then will we find the patience to put up with one another with grace and forgiveness. Only then will we find the humility to accept into our fellowship the poor, the hurting, the downtrodden, and the broken. Friends, the church is a bride. She's the bride of Christ. So why in the world today should you cherish the church? Because Christ does. Why should you love the church today? Because Jesus does. Why should you give of yourself? Why should you invest your life in the church? Because Christ the Lamb gave his life for her that he might redeem and ready and reward her with himself. Or more fundamentally still, why should we leave? Why should we continue to turn from this world to be part of Christ's bride and to cling to him because he relishes his bride. 
and because he left heaven so that he might be with her and bring her to be with him and give himself to her. We love him because he first loved us. We cherish him because he first cherished us. So let us rejoice, let us exalt, let us give to him all of the glory. Let's pray. Father, we do just that, rejoice, exalt, take comfort and encouragement and give you all the glory for what you have, are, and will do in the bride of Christ, the church. It's altogether beautiful. Would we be encouraged in our hearts tonight to give of ourselves ever more freely to this bride, to cherish her as you do, and most centrally to give ourselves fully to our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ, for whose coming we look and we long in Jesus' name, amen.